Each time I buy a new Mac, I'm going with a clean setup. I never use the Migration Assistant, even though it takes more time to install and configure all of the apps. After a while of using your machine, there's quite a lot of unnecessary files that you don't want to carry around. In this video, I want to share with you my setup process and share with you which developer apps do I use. I'm an iOS developer and maybe you will find some useful apps that you never heard of. My name is Mike and let's get started. First thing that I always do after the initial setup is to check if system is up to date. Then I turn on the system firewall. Inside the firewall options, I also enable stealth mode, which tells your Mac to ignore any request attempts in a public network, instead of saying that a port is closed. Using airdrop, I will then transfer a bash script file, which contains quite a lot of default values that I like. For example, I like to disable press and hold for keys and repeat a key instead, also changing the key repeat rate. I will later show how it works in practice. I like to have my dock on the left side instead of the bottom position, automatically hidden so it doesn't take any space when it's not in use. And I change the height animation to zero as the default one is extremely slow. If you are curious how long your build takes, use this one. In Xcode, after each build, you will see how many seconds it took. Let's run the script. After the system restart, you can see how the dog behaves when I reach the left side of the screen. It is instant, there is no unnecessary animation. In order to get maximum keyboard speed, go to the system preferences and choose keyboard. Set key repeat to fast and delay until repeat to short. Let's see how it works. As you can see, there is no unnecessary delay. Okay, so we have the basic settings. Now it's time to install apps. I'm a huge fan of controlling the whole network access on my Mac. I like to know if apps are trying to send something over the internet. Of course, when you are using a web browser, it will have a full internet access. But when you are using an app which is recording a screen and it suddenly wants to send some data to unknown server, uh, it is something that you would like to know. That's why I use a little snitch. It gives me a full control on each app internet access. At the beginning, it will be a little annoying, but it will be better over time. Homebrew. This one probably doesn't need an introduction. It is a great apps manager which will help you install and update apps. It is a must have. Here you can also see the little snitch in action. One of the most popular iOS dependencies manager is Cartage. Cartage builds your dependencies and provides you with binary frameworks. There were some issues with it uh, when using with the Apple Silicon, but since February last year, it supports XC frameworks. So it's all good. Mint is a package manager that installs and runs Swift command line tool packages. It makes installing and running Swift tools easier. Swift format is a great tool for reformatting Swift code. By having a set of rules, you can be sure that your code base will be consistent. And when you are working with other team members, there will no longer be fights about styling the code. There is also an Xcode Swift extension. This one can be run directly inside Xcode while you edit the code, instead of being run after each save of a file or with a git hook. For example, you can change the shortcut command plus p, so instead of printing the file, it will reformat it. Now it's time to finally install the Xcode but I highly recommend you not to go to the App Store and just get one. When the new version of Xcode will be released, uh, you probably would like to check first if 
your project will still run and everything is safe and sound before updating. It happened to me uh, more times than I would like to admit that I forgot to turn off uh, auto update uh, in the app store and got the new Xcode that was not working. To avoid this issue, I always install the Xcode, Xcodes app. This app lets you browse all of the available Xcode versions and install them, also including the beta versions. SwiftLint is a linter, so it is doing a static code analysis to help you flag potential errors or suspicious constructions. It is similar to Swift format, but instead of reformatting the code, it will mark it. For example, if you use force unwrap, it can mark it as an error. SwiftGen helps you automatically generate Swift code for the resources in your project. So we can be sure that you will not make a typo and you will also get auto-completion. SwiftyMocky helps you write tests. It automatically mocks Swift protocols and protocol compositions. It scans your source code and generates those mocks. It significantly speeds up the whole testing process. Okay, now let's talk about Ruby. By default, there is a pre-installed version in every macOS, but the best practice is to use a Ruby version manager. In this case, I will be installing rbenv, which helps to keep Ruby up to date and switch to a different version if needed. I use Ruby mostly for tools like CocoaPods, Fastlane and Bundler. We have the latest Ruby version, now we can install CocoaPods. This one probably does not need an introduction. CocoaPods is a dependency manager for Swift projects. Keep in mind that on the CocoaPods homepage, the installation guide is using sudo. I think that when you use pre-installed system Ruby, you need to use sudo, but uh, when using RBN, you don't have to use it and actually you should not install all of your gems with sudo command. For working with Git, I usually go with a hybrid approach, which means that I use terminal for most of the Git commands like committing, merging, rebasing. For staging files or checking the changes, I use app called lazygit, which is a visual Git client in your terminal. Last but not least, the app without which I can't imagine my iOS development, the Proximan. Proximan allows you to inspect and intercept all of the network traffic. You can see all of the network requests that uh, your app makes. The best part is that you can mock them with local files. So if the backend is not ready yet, that's all right. You can just add whatever you need to the request. It also works with the HTTPS connection after installing a root certificate. I'm going to make a separate video about the Proxman and Charles Proxy as those tools are crucial for app development. Alright, so that's my initial MacBook setup for development. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.